Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Ryan, co-founder of Portrait, and today I'll be talking about how we're using IPFS to build decentralized websites. Um, so the IPFS ecosystem offers opportunities for data ownership, for privacy, and for control. And when you're building decentralized websites or creating tools to build decentralized websites, you have to face certain challenges which you don't really discover or see in Web2. So we're talking about storage and content distribution and also about user experience and identity. So I'm happy that I will be talking about that today and let's dive more a bit, a bit more deeper in like user apps being built on top of IPFS. Um, so this talk will be a bit technical, but also a bit more on the side of production. So we are building an app out there that's actually running on top of IPFS. Today, Portrait has over 10,000 users and we have a lot of learnings from that. And there are a lot of small like design challenges you're, fa you're facing and we'll talk a bit more about those. So first off, we'll kick off with Portrait, why Portrait, how Portrait works as well. And then we'll kind of jump into IPFS. So why IPFS? Why is Portrait building on top of IPFS? And then we'll talk about solving design challenges. And there are a few design challenges out there we haven't solved yet. And we are very like eager to fix them ourselves. But obviously, today we're a team of two, by the way. So it's quite hard to balance 10,000 users and trying to come up with new solutions to certain problems, right? So um, also putting those out there and some stuff we're excited about and a short recap. So the new internet is about self-sovereign identity, right? So you should be able to control your identity, express who you are in, in the way you'd like to do that. And if we look at how Web3 does that today, um, there are a few things that, that quite concern us at a, concerned us at the time. So let's say you'd like to write a blog, then you should probably use Mirror or Paragraph, or any of the many solutions out there. There are a lot of solutions out there to write your blog. And what if you're an artist and you'd like to kind of publish your new NFT release or release your new collection? Then Alchemy says that there are 135 solutions out there to do so. But what if you'd like to do both? What if you'd like to kind of write your blog and release NFTs, then and like, those are two things, but what if you add a third one, a fourth one, or a fifth one? And for every solution out there, there's a DAP. But at the end of the day, let's take Joe for an example here, you have kind of one identity. So let's say that Joe owns Joe.eth and that's one identity. And Joe doesn't want to have all of his data or all of his creations and his expressions scattered around the web, right? Because he has Joe.eth. And Joe.eth is more than a textual representation of your Ethereum address. Joe.eth is also a visual, ex a visual representation of his Ethereum address. And we can actually do that by going into the ENS uh, domain manager and using the power of IPFS to kind of link a SID, an IPFS SID, an IPFS hash to his identity. And we have already been working on implementing this in, in, into several browsers, not us as, por as Portrait, obviously, but us in the space. So if you head over to uh, Gilliam.eth, which is my co-founder, by the way, if you head over to Gilliam.eth in Opera or Brave, it natively resolves. You don't even have to install an extension or anything. And in Google Chrome, if you, if you installed MetaMask, which I think every one of us here who uses MetaMask in Chrome as well, like, all right, there's a few, a few hands there, but if you actually use MetaMask in Chrome or any other browser, by the way, that doesn't really matter, you can head over to your ETH domain, so let's say gilliam.eth in Chrome as well. So it's not natively built in there, but you can use MetaMask, which kind of, I don't know if anyone even was aware, aware of that. So um, what's happening then is that you can actually, again, it's, it, it's a single content hash to a single source. But Joe or Gilliam would like to bring all those kind of sources into one, into one kind of visual representation. And if he'd like to do that today, 
The only way to do that is actually building your own website. And let's say you're a Web3 creator and you take the entire set of Web3 creators, then only the technical subset of those creators are able to actually design and code their own website and then use either Fleek or Third Web to publish their website. And that's where Portrait comes in. So we are the visual expression layer of Web3. We offer a decentralized website builder and protocol that allows Web3 creators to truly express themselves and create, control, and govern their own visual identity. So your portrait is, again, fully controlled and owned by you and requires no coding or design experience. It's your kind of visual, re visual representation of your Ethereum address for the new internet. So we're actually, li actually live today. We have a private beta, and again, we have over 10,000 users right now. So I'll try to give a live demo. I know that the previous demo, there was kind of like, the Wi-Fi can be qu quite bad, so let's hope it works. So this is our builder. If you can actually, and there it is. Let's move some data there. So essentially, anyone should be able to create their own portrait, their own decentralized website. This is kind of a pain for me because I'm having to look on that screen to actually build a portrait, but let's try anyways. So you can select any of these components, which kind of looks similar to any conventional website builder, but it's actually much more than that. So let's actually, so let's say we have an avatar. which should go in here. And there's the avatar. And what's happening right now, everything is being stored, is pinned on IPFS. And we've partnered up with Estuary to actually offload this file, these files onto the Filecoin network as well. All right, so I'll just add Joe here and then I'll call it a day for now, otherwise I'll hurt my neck too much. <laughs> so what we also do is we're adding tags and these tags are stored on chain as well um, so that we can kind of create recommendations for other users to find and connect with like-minded individuals. So I'm publishing this right now. You're actually signing with your Ethereum address the contents of the website. And when we're signing it, we're actually attestating the transaction or kind of we are delegating the authority of updating your portrait to another party, which in this case is us. Um, I'll dive a bit deeper into the contract in a bit. And then once the transaction itself has settled, the portrait is updated. Right now, it's, it's a bit obviously empty, but we can actually showcase how it works in Brave. So, for example, this is the ENS domain link to the specific portrait. And this natively resolves. And this is all in IPFS and Filecoin. So, I think, yeah. That's, so, yeah, again, this is, this is a very easy, uh, like, low-level example. Uh, we have some, some private invite codes. So Gilliam is in the back, and if you'd like an invite code, reach out. He'll, he'll give you an invite code. Uh, so I'll actually dive a bit into the protocol. Um, this is a very, very early implementation of the protocol as well. We're in, in beta. But I'll dive a bit deeper into a pretty cool um, design challenge we have solved. So this is the actual contract itself. Um, and one of the design challenges we face is that on one side, you don't want to have the user or let make the user pay for every transaction to update the state, especially if you're kind of releasing the protocol on a very cheap network. So let's say you're just updating the state of a portrait through Polygon or uh, any like very cheap one to update the state, right? You kind of are able to cover those costs by yourself quite easily. So why go out and about to 
make the user pay for that. So from one angle, you have the fact that if we kind of are the one that updates the state of your portrait, then who's actually governing portrait itself? The one that is able to kind of update the state. And if you're always delegating authority to us, then it's basically you're always relying on us. So it's kind of, we have two functions right now, which is set personal IPFS, sit by proof, which is kind of delegating the authority to us and, and kind of give us a proof to update the state of your portrait within the contract. And the other one is kind of the fallback where you're always able to update the hash by yourself if you'd like to. So let's say the, the kind of backend of portrait today or our provider that kind of does all the transactions are, is falling away today, will fall away, then we always have this catch. And that, will, that means that the user is always able to do so, kind of update the portrait by himself. Um, in addition, a lot of people are building portraits and you can either do one or two things. You can either upload the entirety of the website or you can kind of create two separate processes where on one side you have a renderer which kind of takes in information and then creates a website uh, from it. So what we've done is we actually separated da the data from the, from the website renderer itself and the website renderer itself can actually easily be deployed on IPFS and that by itself saves quite some storage if you're looking at uh, storage protocols beyond Falcoin because Falcoin tends to be really cheap for like uh, low level storage but uh, other protocols out there can become quite expensive if you if you're uploading multiple MBs right so um, yeah on this note this by itself resulted in another design challenge which, which we haven't solved yet so uh, if any I'll dive I'll tell that in retrospect um, yeah, so this is a quick example, quick demo. I can actually show a bit more right now because I'm not actually having to turn my neck all the time. So you can add different types of components and really like make your decentralized website feel and experience kind of like Web2. So not only are creators able to build a portrait, but my grandma and my mom should be able to create, create a portrait too. So that's, we really focus on, on the UX there. Um, yeah, you can customize it the way you want. We have teams as well. And tomorrow I'll be actually giving a talk about how we kind of use uh, AI, AI. We use OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT to fetch data, map to your Ethereum address, and then create a portrait, which can be kind of scarily accurate. And we had people reach out to us and ask, how do you actually know this about, about, about me? So from that angle, it will be more a talk about the ethical side and kind of should we share all this or should we openly put all this personal data on chain? Uh, but that's, that's a talk for tomorrow. So um, let's head back into, yeah, that sounds good. So yeah. Uh, we just like scratch the surface of how Portrait uses IPFS and let's dive a bit deeper into that. So when building kind of products, you approach it with a certain design philosophy and when building products in Web3, you always have this, you always have this trade-off between UX on one side and decentralization on the other side. Uh, but kind of in the Web3 world, we tend to map decentralization to blockchain governance. If a single entity governs a network, it's centralized. And we kind of view or look at this from like this binary thing where it's either true or false. And we have to wonder if that actually applies for the web as, as well. And that isn't really the case because when we're building dApps, we're often relying on an Infura or an alchemy to be kind of either the RPC endpoint or to pro provide us on-chain information. And that by itself, relying on a single API provider is centralized, but that doesn't really matter. And that's actually pretty okay to do because anyone at any given time can verify whether either Alchemy or Infura is actually sending the correct information out. Um, so 
on top of that, it kind of leads to the panop panopticon principle. It's a psychology principle where because of the fact we can verify the chain on any given, at, at any given time, we actually have to do it less. So this kind of originates from uh, a prison principle where you kind of had a, a, a guard, guard tower in the middle and then you'd have all the inmates in a circular, circular f f form around the guard tower, so to speak. Um, and as a result, uh, the you had to hire less guards because the guard in the tower could look into any specific prison cell at any given time. Um, and on top of that, for bad actors, or not necessarily intentionally bad actors, but for, for incorrect data, so to speak, it's kind of a one-way street where, let's say, a certain API provider provides incorrect information, which kind of does harm to the network or to the community, community and the ecosystem, then it's easy for us to kind of shift from A to B or from B to C. Um, so that's really interesting. But if we compare kind of how we accept um, kind of the infuras and the alchemies within the dApps, no one ever considers that centralized. Uh, there, there's a few things we really underestimate here. Um, one is that it might take a few minutes for the guard to actually visit the cell of, let's say, the bad actor. Uh, the second one is, um, so that, that, like, that, that results in there's a certain time period, a certain epoch in which a bad actor can actually do harm to the network. The second one is, unlike shining a flashlight into a cell, which is quite an easy process, actually verifying the data on chain requires quite some work, quite some work. So let's say you're starting from a zero state, then you'll actually have to sync the entire chain or like in terms of bandwidth storage, that, that's quite some work. With IPFS, that's much easier. Um, however, we'll, we're still doing it in, a, in, in, in the same fashion. So we can fetch data from a centralized gateway and if the gateway is compromised or a bad actor, we can actually um, shift to another gateway and then that specific gateway that served incorrect content is now kind of losing its rep reputation. Um, however, if you're comparing the work it takes with Ethereum and IPFS, IPFS is much, much easier because with IPFS, you can use packages such as multi-formats to actually like practically instantly verify whether data which comes from a gateway is correct or not. And that's one of the design challenges we face at Portrait. And that's also the main reason why IPFS is the backbone of Portrait. Uh, so uh, our uh, approach to Portrait and I think an approach to building Web3 products in general is to be agnostic to protocols or solutions out there as much as possible. Um, so however, we're still in a foundation built on top of IPFS. Uh, so it's easy to shift from one gateway to another, and it's also easy to actually validate the content that's being served. So, and this is, this is actually a strange one. So with the power of IPLD, IPFS is designed in such a way that you can even go as far as creating kind of these trustless dApps that mostly rely on a single centrally governed AWS S3 instance, which by itself, Amazon, which by itself is governed by a single global conglomerate named Amazon. Uh, and that would by itself be more kind of trustless and easily, more easily verifiable than uh, running a kind of decentralized dApp that mostly rely on a centralized blockchain RPC endpoint or API provider. Uh, so when you think about it, that's kind of, well, you have AWS on the other side, how can it be more uh, kind of decentralized or more trustless than, than, um, than Ethereum or at least an eth Ethereum API provider. And we, we kind of adopted this philosophy of decentralization is not mutual, like, mutually exclusive. It's kind of this spectrum where you have trade-offs between UX and trade-offs between decentralization. And your aim should always be to create a product which is 
as trustless as possible while still having a great UX. So in the end, relying on Infura and Alchemy for, for reading and writing data to your DAP is actually a good thing, good thing, and better than running a centralized MongoDB instance. So what kind of challenges have we solved and are we working on today? Um, one of those challenges is working, uh, kind of dealing with bad actors and compromised gateways, which we just spoke about. We solve those issues by doing client-side verification of actually the content that's being served. Uh, second one is we're combining content addressing with location-based addressing. Uh, it's kind of to improve loading speed, but still keep the kind of trustless level of portrait pretty high, pretty strong. So the third one is how we are improving the speed of serving decentralized web content by using IPFS with other on-chain storage protocols. And this one actually, so, so the, the, the first thing we're looking at is content addressing combined with location-based addressing. And we got inspired by the HTML integrity att attribute. Uh, and that's basically, uh, that's like in the standards of HTML and it's quite underestimated. I will dive a bit deeper into it right now because we started off with using a mix of location-based and content, content addressing by actually using a gateway and then pretty much adding the hash to, adding the IPFS hash to it, right? Then we kind of moved to using the IPFS prefix and then letting either the browser or an extension kind of work out which gateway would be the best possible. The third step would be, what if we kind of shift things around? What if we kind of use an IPFS hash as a second kind of layer to a location-based address. Um, so what you can do is you can actually use Amazon S3 to uh, improve loading speed and improve getting actual, the actual data onto the client, but you can still kind of verify whether or not that data is actually somewhere on IPFS. And basically, if it's not, you can also get it on IP, put that on IPFS because you can still fetch it from S3. But, um, in this way, you kind of improve the UX where you can kick off with loading the actual website and if I, uh, resolving the data from IPFS takes a while, that's okay. But at least you can still kind of serve content until, uh, like, you can serve untrusted content and kind of notify the user that in the background you're still trying to fetch everything from IPFS and actually verify whether the content is valid or not. But in this way, you're at least serving something and not letting the user wait for, for content. Uh, so in addition, obviously, Portrait is built on top of Falcoin, uh, but at Portrait, we also take the design philosophy of, in, generally speaking, you don't want to rely on a single provider. And we're also aiming to do that with storage protocols as well. So IPFS truly empowers beyond Falcoin and IPFS empowers kind of to go broader. And I think every storage protocol has its, tra has its trade offs. And one of the uh, solutions we're working on is actually looking at other protocols such as our reef, where we are kind of adestating the data from IPFS onto our reef itself, where we kind of, so you can take that from two perspectives, where one, you're using S3. The other one would be using another decentralized storage protocol. And then you're actually stacking multiple storage protocols together and using GraphQL, you can actually fetch the data. So um, these are kind of thinking, this way of thinking is kind of in a storage agnostic design where you have trade-offs on all levels where uh, you kind of, yeah, you kind of have to take that into account. Uh, so challenges to be solved, hopefully. Um, the first one is really interesting. I'm, I'm not sure if someone is working on this already, but we kind of have, our, our main challenge today is kind of getting authentication, user auth on kind of multiple instances of portrait, whether that's a different IPFS gateway or a different protocol. And 
that's mostly because authentication today kind of works in a similar fashion to location-based versus, uh, no, not necessarily versus, but in a location-based way where authentication is mapped to a domain name, and that's, that's location-based. So what if we can kind of create a similar system in which we also can create content-based authentication and kind of derive a certain hash or a certain proof from a DAP, and if that's all fine, we can kind of um, base authentication on top of that. Um, I'm sure there are some security issues there, but that's something we're kind of, we hope that there will be upcoming solutions there that you can kind of move authentication away from a single entity governing authentication as well. So yeah, um, a, a second one, and that's kind of more related to ENS today is, in the beginning I spoke about how we kind of separate data from the renderer to kind of save space, storage space. Um, and as a result, you kind of need to add a query parameter to an IPFS hash to uh, kind of load a user conditionally into the app. So on the, on the above, you can see what doesn't work within IPFS, and that's app and adding the query parameter for, the con for a conditionally uh, rendered portrait, which is a certain user. And below, you can see what works, which is the, just a simple IPFS hash. And that means that today at Portrait, we have to generate, store, and offload separate files to actually create individual portraits. And it would be great if we can kind of load logic conditionally from a single source. Um, so to round this off, and something which I, al I already covered, um, at Portrait, we believe that decentralization is not mu mutually exclusive. Rather, it's a spectrum. It's not something to, it's not a light switch which is on or off. And as a app developer and designer, you kind of have to take a lot of things into account. Um, today, we're at 10,000 users. If, you'd be, if, you, if you would like to be part of a few, like 10,000, one, two, three, you can head, head over to Gilliam to ask for an invite code and uh, he'll be happy to onboard you guys. Thank you very much. So can you go back to the last slide really quick, the one with the query parameters? Um, so what I'm just trying to understand like what you're trying to gain out of this. So mm -hmm. that query parameter, are you thinking that you want that to be passed into the page, um, into that like wherever that CID lives? And did you, or like are you trying to make like a template there where you'd like to pass that information into it and then it like fill it out? Like what's, what's the goal from that one? Yeah, so this is not something we're working on, but we'd like to see that being solved. Let's say you run a DAP which takes in any arbitrary information conditionally through, let's say, a query parameter, then if you'd like to do that today, that's simply impossible because that's not within the standards of ENS. Um, so in order for us to actually generate portraits or map them to an ENS domain, we have to create or publish the actual website for every user, right? And that takes up unnecessary space. And with Filecoin, obviously, that's really cheap, but there are other protocols out there where that gets quite expensive. So keeping stuff into a tiny JSON uh, object would be very, like, I mean, in terms of scalability, that would be the best, even for Filecoin in the long term. Okay, thank you. Uh, but you mentioned that you split apart renderers and data models. So couldn't you just request the render and then just give a CID to the data model? So that, that's what we're doing right now. But that's still like really hacky because then you still have to create individual SIDs for every single user. Uh, so in the worst case, like in the less, like if you're looking at the worst possible solution out there, you'll actually offload the data itself. But let's say you're, you're writing a, like you're using JS to kind of fetch the renderer from one place and fetch 
the, the data from another place, you'd still have to create a file which actually does that, right? You still have to create the logic and link that to uh, an ENS domain to actually do that. Yeah, but I mean, like, the blocks of the renders could be, like, deduplicated on IPFS, and then you could just, like, people might have the same, like, similar SIDs. Mm -hmm. Well, they might have different SIDs for their renders because maybe they have different combination of, like, components, but the base components would still be stored in IPFS as deduplicated blocks. And then the data models should change because they're specific to a user. So, I don't know, there's just a thought. Yeah. So this solution, this solution just uh, results into having to create one file, one app for, for every single user and then conditionally load any data into it. Um, and that's kind of the way we're looking at it potentially. But in terms of like, in terms of storage capacity, so to speak, I think creating new SIDs for every user doesn't take that much space, doesn't take up that much space, but generally speaking, if we could kind of approach it from this way, why even generate new SIDs for every single user, right? But that, that's just our take on it. Um, I'm still very curious if someone else creates logic which still kind of generates a new SID for every individual, but does it in a more efficient way than we're doing today, because I'm sure there will be people out there who are able to create that process in a more like efficient way. So just within the context of portrait, uh, it'd be great, but I think also in the context of the entire ecosystem where you have a lot of dApps that uh, likely will render stuff conditionally, a solution which is efficient uh, uh, would probably be great, yeah.